I'm Dr. Pete Economo, the East Coast psychologist. And I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin, the West Coast psychologist. And this is When East Meets West. So Pete, we decided today to talk about private practice because we realized, you know, it's kind of funny, like most people, even clinicians don't really um, understand like why are therapists most like, why are so many therapists in private practice? Why is this how the system is set up? And, you know, given that this podcast is about all things psychology related, it seemed like kind of funny we hadn't talked about this yet. I know. And it's a beautiful blend of some East West stuff. Maybe we'll find that, but also just the business of helping people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and I think it's important, um, you know, whoever's listening to this podcast, if you're a clinician, um, of course, like this is, this is going to be relevant to you and different ways that you can, um, earn a livelihood, right. Or earn a, earn a living though. I also think it's really important for non-clinicians listening to this who may have some curiosities or misunderstandings, or even maybe judgments about why this is the, this is such a common, uh, way that, um, you know, access to care is set up. And, and I, yeah. I think it's important. We'll talk about this more in a moment. It, you know, Pete and I are both in private practice and, and I will say, this is bottom of my heart. True. It, it's not, it's not a system I necessarily agree with. I don't, no. it's like, it's the system that we have in the United States. So it's not, yeah. it's not a, it, I don't like that. This is what we uh, are working with, but there are reasons why so many clinicians are in private practice, um, which we'll yeah. talk about in a minute. Um, but, but it's not, I'm not like, this is the great, this is the great way to do it. It's just kind of like, this is the way it's set up for some kind of messed up reasons um, in our healthcare system. Yeah. So there's lots of flaws in that for sure, which we'll highlight. And I mean, yeah. to be clear, my private practice is really um, much smaller than yours, in, you know, in terms of like um, you know, responsibility. You know, I think that, you know, you're, cause I, I don't know. If I was so funny. I think the opposite because people. Well, let's maybe because you because you have a group. You have like a bigger group practice. I just uh, right. yeah. So well, I'll let's, talk. Let's talk about. Let's I'll talk. talk. Yeah. Well, let's start there. <laughs> yeah. 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 So there's group and there's you know sole um, sole provider uh, group. And so the reason I was saying mine's less is because I serve as the director, but I have a clinical director. I have people that kind of function within my practice. So that actually at this point in my stage, I'm hardly seeing anybody. I'm seeing very you know very a very small caseload, um, and. It's because I have my other responsibilities of you know research sure. and, and teaching and and, and um, administrative stuff within the university, uh, and so um, the group practice just has other clinicians that can see clients that are seeking mental health, uh, and and so. But I guess in general, the private practice uh, is because th the system is set up so that we are um, okay. I'm just going to say it. You know, <laughs> we it's hard for <laughs> it's large hospitals and like medical systems can advocate for larger reimbursement from insurance companies. It's a lot harder mm -hmm. for mental health providers because we don't have like a ton of overhead and, you know, like the, the, the business model. Um, but also we don't have a lot of power because we, because actually the APA found that almost like 40 to 60% of psychologists are in private practice. Right. Right. And well, so, okay. So let me, cause I would love, I would love yeah. for you to tell listeners a little about your private practice in a minute here, but yeah, let me, let me add to that. So let me yeah. explain for, for those listeners that don't understand why, why that's the case. And, sure. I, and I'm sure it's probably similar um, percentages for other types of mental health I would therapists. imagine too. Like, yeah. You yeah. know, like, uh, like social workers and LPCs. Counselors. And yep. Yes. Uh -huh. So basically, and, and you, you know, as a listener, you, you may have one of these beliefs, you know, in, at least in American culture, there is sort of a, a, a belief that because we're like therapists are, are helping people we're doing and, you know, they're, we're doing something um, that is about helping people that, you know, that, that we shouldn't, I think I've heard things like you shouldn't be in it for the money I've heard yeah. basically, which the kernel of truth is I agree. Right. Well, I, well, I would say I agree in the fact <laughs> that I've like, of course, like it's not, you don't become a therapist cause you're, you know, you're not, it, you're not going to make a billion dollars being a therapist, right? However, it's very interesting because other types of healthcare providers, like physicians, nurses, physicians assistants, look, they are uh, they are also helping people. They also get yes. into that work because they they want to contribute and they want to they've been to the helping field. However, yes. I would say culturally, we tend to believe that those we tend to revere those folks more i would yeah. say generally 
And we tend to believe that they, their expertise and their training is worth something financially. So yeah. I've actually, I mean, I'm sure some people have judgments about this, but I've never heard a story like, you know, a nurse or a doctor shouldn't make a good living because no. they want to help people. Right. And the reality is insurance then pays those folks really well for yeah. what their training is worth based on, and, and, you know, for you guys are, our, our training is very, very long when you're in healthcare. It's very, very expensive. It's a lot of personal sacrifice, frankly, yeah. in any kind of healthcare. Um, but mental by, health when you say, when you say, yes. us, when you uh-huh. say us there, you're speaking, you're saying psychologists. Or I'm saying healthcare. I'm saying any healthcare provider. So That's right. therap- like mental yep. health, physical health, does anything, anybody okay. in healthcare. Yeah. Um, if we talk specifically about mental mental health um, care, um, unfortunately, we are very um, devalued when it comes to reimbursement. So what Pete's yes. talking about, if if I and I know different systems in LA, for example, or in California, are like this, there's like a major healthcare system that if you're a physician on staff, you make an amazing salary. If you're a psychologist, you make extre- extremely low salary. Right. Even though a psychologist, like we could say in a physician, have um, similar training backgrounds. That's um, right. Right. You know, when you say similar, you're saying in terms of like time and money and time and money. Exactly. Yeah, so right. the so the the problem becomes that mental health clinicians, if they are in network, mm-hmm. and and this is not true for everybody, and I want to make sure, like I always. I'm always looking for really good clinicians and network, um, yeah. you know, and maybe somebody lives in an area where that's low cost or they have a partner or family that can support them financially and they're able to take insurance. But um, most clinicians can't afford to literally like do things like pay back their student loans, pay their right. bills if they accept what insurance will pay them. Right. And that's pretty shocking to a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I feel, I mean, I feel very passionate about this because I'm like, this is not, yeah. It's not, it, it basically, and then it impacts access to care, by the it way, does. For, ther- for people out there, because there's, it's, you know, a lot of, it's like, then all the good clinicians get pushed out of network and go yeah. into private practice like ourselves. And it's yeah. hard to then figure out, like, how do I go see a really great therapist? And let me pray. And access to care just yeah. for listeners means that, you know, not everyone can afford, uh, yes. you know, specialty, really any provider. So sometimes mm-hmm. you might you know, uh, recently I've been hearing my mom as, you know, in her older age, kind of talk about trying to get doctor appointments um, for her yes. and her husband. And so there, it's, you know, sometimes two, three, four month waits. Uh, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of what some socialized healthcare systems, mm-hmm. that's what they judge about it is that you only have X amount of providers and it takes you years to get in or months to get in. Mm-hmm. And, and we don't have that technically here um, in the US. And yet, uh, you know, there's still not such a great access to care. No, it's very, very hard to navigate the system and it's very, very hard to find care that's affordable. And so, you know, there's a a conundrum here where it's like people like, like Pete and myself, like we get into this field because we want to help people and we want to provide effective, you know, evidence-based treatment. Um, And we also are humans who um, have our own, financial responsibilities, right? And we and have devoted a lot of time and, you know, money, frankly, and energy. And so this is where a lot of us end up um, going into private practice. And to be clear, private practice is not about, um, this is the also, I think, really important thing for listeners to understand. It's not about just going into private practice to like make a ton of money, charge whatever you want. That's, that's right. I'm sure there's people that do that, but that's actually not why. This no. is the really bizarre thing. If you are somebody who has out of network benefits in your insurance plan, insurance companies will pay you back more money for a session than they would pay me or Pete. It's so we bizarre. Accepted them directly. Yeah. It's so, it, it, I know people are like, why is that? I'm like, yeah. I literally have no idea. Yeah. It is. And it is. And that is the thing that is like so shocking to most yeah. patients when I explain that. They'll say, like, it's not. It, if if they paid us what they pay you right as the patient we could go yeah, in we network take insurance yeah, yeah we could go in, we could go yeah. in network so i want people to understand that because i also want them to understand that clinicians aren't like trying to they're not they're not trying to they're not they're not like out to get you we're not working you know the system yeah there's no, no. it's yeah the system's no, worked us it's, 
Yes. And it, and it continues to be that way. And of course, yeah. like we could do an entire other episode, right. On like how healthcare. Up the healthcare system, yeah. you, know, you know, but, um, well, I don't know. As, so well, as, going, but as yeah. you're saying yeah. that, like that, this is like the algorithm behind insurance. And so, yes. we're not, you know, so, yes. you know, it's like life insurance is uh, calculations that go into, if you're going to die, what yes. when you would die, how much premium would be. And that's exactly. So when you're saying that, that I'm assuming the insurance companies have obviously done their due diligence to run that algorithm, which says, Many patients and providers are less likely to submit out-of-network compl- um, uh, claims because it's a lot of work. Yes. My office yes. manager has to follow up hours every week. Yes. Because uh, you know, in our private practice um, here on the East Coast, we submit claims for our clients. Uh, and so she's following up when they're rejected because they're always rejected at least a couple of times. Um, you know, and again, it's like a numbers thing because that does make it much more difficult for people. And then like I did this morning, trying to pay a parking ticket, I just gave up and closed. The, <laughs> the, um, right. The it will, will correct. And so that's what they do. And so you can think yeah. about, so if, if clinicians aren't, you know, getting paid by insurance, another problem, right. They, yeah. they don't pay like, at some point, a clinician to say like, well, I can't pay my my office rent or I can't pay my mortgage or whatever yeah. thing. I can't, you know, I need to get paid. So I'm going to go out of network. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I want, I, I do. So that is why most clinicians in the United States go private practice, the private yeah. practice route. So, you know, again, we could do a whole other episode on like, yeah, let's change the system because the system is a problem. Right. Um, but I think it's also important for listeners to know, like, if you're looking for, higher quality, um, you know, high quality clinicians. And it's not to say you can't find them in network because you can't, there are really good clinicians that are in network. Of course. just, it's just harder to find because a lot like, you know, well, because 40 to 60% are, are, are in private. Correct. Yeah. So just correct. Correct. So, so the first step would be find out if your insurance has, has out of network benefits. You might have it. A lot of times people have it and they don't know. Yes. Yep. So yep. find out if you have out of network benefits. Um, you want to also you know, actually do your good your due diligence to research if there are providers that are in network. Uh, I know that you know people like Nikki and I can can kind of help. I mean, we have probably a referral list of providers that are in network that we can try and give some names. Um, the problem you run into, which is the access thing, is that they're often not accepting new clients. Um, which can be another challenge that people run into. So one of the things I want to say before you go into your next thing is that it could be frustrating. And so I think just try and like um, notice uh, the frustration of this um, as you're trying to kind of, you know, go through this system. Um, A lot of practices in large hospital systems actually hire case managers now, um, or a lot of state um, psychological associations will um, provide consumers with, um, ways uh, and like lists of people to kind of help uh, give some resources, uh, they might be able to help in that kind of way too. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll say it is frustrating. And it's, yeah. it is, it's like, I mean, I feel frustrated and for people totally. and I do, and Pete and I do. Yes. And it's, it, it is, it's maddening when you're trying to find somebody that is affordable um, and uh, or accepts your insurance, you know, if that's yeah. what you're looking for. But, but I would say, honestly, like the first thing to do, and you can definitely, yes, you can always reach out to clinicians, Pete, myself, my other colleagues, we do try to like help people find, get, get people connected with care. But I would say if you have insurance, the first thing that I would do that would make it easiest is, is before you even call people, find out if you have out of network benefits. And yeah. if you do, um, you'll find out how much your deductible is how much you need to spend before you'll be reimbursed and then how much they'll cover per session yeah. going in with that information will actually give you access to more clinicians that are in private practice because that's right most clinicians in private practice are not accepting insurance directly right um i think it's important then to say on the other side if you're a clinician listening to this it's like and you are you know maybe you're not um being paid um, or earning what you need to earn and you're thinking about private practice, it's also important to understand what Pete and I are talking about right now. I know a lot of clinicians that don't know about totally. this because they don't teach us, by the way, guys, they don't teach us about this in grad school. At they don't all. even teach us about this, which is kind of bananas, right? It's, like it's a system we work in and we don't even talk about insurance, like how that works. It's so bananas. And actually what the, the first doctoral program I developed, I built in a one credit business course for that reason, because I think so I, smart. I yeah. learned so much along the way. Um, and I know that you've got a great course that helps people learn along the way. And so now there's like some, re- we understand that more. I will say as a PhD applicant or student, we're trained and coached not to talk about private practice because we're supposed to want to be scholar researchers. So I love that you gave space for that, where you said, 
many other professions aren't like, I, I can't make money, you know, like I have to help people. And and so it has kind of brainwashed us in a way that like, we can't do it. It has what makes it, it, it's, well, again, it's also a little bit like, it's dirty to talk yeah. about it kind yeah. of. And, and that's, I think what's what, when I, and I want to be really clear, it's like, this is a, but it's like everybody, I mean, for anybody listening, whatever job you have, everybody deserves to be paid for yes. their time. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. It's like, there's not. No, I mean, again, like if we lived in a world where we didn't have to pay for things, it'd be different. Well, know, just, but... and, and it's like that rule that we can't talk about our fees on listservs and like professional listservs. And I don't know if mm. I think that's because of like state licensure kind of monopoly law or something. Do you, are you even familiar I don't, with that? I, I don't even know. I mean, that's, it's another example of just like, exactly. There is a, there's a, there's a um, secretness. Yes. It's not even private. Like, and, and so we, it, which is again, like these are just, facts like people need to know how much things cost we need to know i yeah. remember being grad school and it was like we we there were students asking we want to ask our professors like what what can a psychologist earn and we're not asking yeah. this to be like oh gosh money it's like okay well we like, just don't know how, <laughs> how can i buy a house can i yeah. like how how long is it going to take to pay my student loans and they wouldn't answer us i you it's know, so and- it's crazy, and it's actually well. I can't believe we're almost running out of time, but I have this quick story for you because actually a colleague of mine I was talking to recently, um, she was saying that she was basically recruiting one of the top people on the East Coast to present on this topic, and the person wrote back, "Just pay me what you want." But she was going to co-present. The other presenter had their fee established already. It was very mm-hmm. high. It was it was worth their value, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. my colleague was like, "I wrote back to this." expert and was like no this is your value and know your value and what a shame yes. that this person didn't have that absolutely and so it's like i think you know i mean hopefully like listeners are, are uh taking some important information here in terms of like how the system works and how to get access to care but i do think it's important to understand um that again Again, everybody deserves to earn a living, including mental health clinicians. And it's like, how do we balance earning a living with access to care? And there is a way to to navigate that, um, you know, somewhat, somewhat here. So, and you know, and I'll mention, as Pete said, like I um, I created a whole course for clinicians called the Complete Private Practice Toolkit uh, to help clinicians that are in private practice that are needing to improve their private practice or people that want to start one, um, because you know, there's just, it's just re- like, we're not trained in this. And, uh, you know, and, and again, then that impacts how we're able to um, explain to potential patients, like about out of network, like the things that we're, we're sharing on the podcast today. That's right. Look, if people, so many people have out of network benefits that don't know it's That's so, right. bana- again, it's so bananas to me and they're not using them. So yeah. look, if you're a clinician and you need help with that, you know, check out uh, the website, private practice toolkit.com. There's a free, there's actually a free free webinars. That's great. I love it. Um, In addition to the course. uh, Thank you. Yes. Pete, Pete is my number one fan here. Um, (laughs) But, um, you know, um, but well, and I actually, honestly, if even if you're not a clinician, if you watch the free webinar, um, you don't have to purchase the course, but um, there's some information about this, about out of network benefits again, which is really important. Yeah. So look, private practice, this is how (laughs) how most clinicians are, um, are offering treatment. Um, we'll do another episode maybe on healthcare holistically, but, yeah, let's um, do that. yes, but, uh, hopefully you are leaving this episode with a little better understanding of why the system is set up the way it is and with a few tools about how to navigate this world of private practice and finding a therapist that's right for you. This has been when East meets West. I'm Dr. Nikki Rubin. And I'm Dr. Pete Economo. Be present, be brave. This has been When East Meets West. All material is based on opinion and educational training of Drs. Pete Economo and Nikki Ruman. Content is for informational and educational purposes only.